All right, welcome everyone to our weekly Q&A session with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubey. Thank you so much for joining us once again this week. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dilshad Berman. I'm a writer and reporter with City and 680 News, and I will be moderating this chat today. Uh, if you've been following along, the way this works is we collect your questions over the past week uh, and we present them to the doctor today. She's never seen them before. This is all off the cuff. Um, if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so under this live broadcast and we will try to get to as many questions as we can in this short 30 minute period that we have with the doctor. For now, I'll start with our questions that we've been collecting over the past week and a little cash that I have over here. We'll start with vaccine related questions because that's been top of mind for many, many weeks now. Um, and then we'll get to all of the other questions as well. So, Doctor, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. Wonderful. Let's get started. We're going to start with um, Charliza's question. Um, Charliza says, my wife had her first dose done on April 23rd uh, and confirmed second dose on August 13th uh, in the Cornell Community Center in Markham. Um, on June 14th, which is a couple of days ago, she received an email from the Ministry of Health saying her booking for the second dose has been canceled and there's no explanation. We've called and waited for hours. No one to explain to us why. Um, can you explain what is happening? What can we do to book her second dose? Okay, so I can't comment on why your the second uh, dose appointment was canceled, though I can say that um, <laughs> that as of if you had your vaccine, from May the 9th or earlier. And uh, Bill said, you tell me if I got the dates wrong because it's constantly changing. You oh, probably have a better sense of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you live in one of, but you have to live in one of the hotspots, and I think York is one of them as well, where there have been Delta variants, then you can book your appointment earlier. Now, the best thing for you to do is to go. Um, so you can go on the provincial booking site to book it. Now, I understand York may not be using that provincial booking site, in which case you would have to go to the York, York Public Health booking site in order to book another appointment. Now, that being said, there are many pharmacies that have a vaccine or will be getting more vaccine. We know that next week, uh, Ontario is going to get millions of Moderna doses, and those are going to be distributed across the province, and those are going to be a really good supply for people to get their second doses. Even if you got your first dose with Pfizer, you can certainly complete your series and get your second dose with Moderna. Those two vaccines are, are interchangeable. Okay, um, wonderful. And then uh, CV and Tina have similar questions regarding the myocarditis uh, diagnosis in um, some young men after Pfizer. Uh, there's a series of questions, so I'm going to go through them because they're actually uh, quite, quite uh, interesting. So let's, uh, let's start with CV. Um, should young men wait for more information before they get their second dose of Pfizer uh, while health authorities are still trying to figure it out? Um, I've heard two things. Maybe don't get the second dose or get it because the benefits outweigh the risks. Okay, so, uh, so the short answer is yes, getting that second dose, the benefits outweigh the risk. So that's the short answer. And the reason for that is because the Delta variant is looming. And, uh, you know, we've seen what happens in the UK where, you know, they detect it and then all of a sudden it takes off. And so that's the reason why we're accelerating those second doses. This is what we know right now about the myocarditis. It's myocarditis and pericarditis. So it's inflammation in the muscle of the heart or the lining of the heart. Um, the uh, US CDC and FDA had a meeting last week and they reported on their data, which was uh, very similar to what uh, Israel saw. More common among uh, teens and uh, young adults up to 24 years of age, um, more common in males than in females, more common after the second dose um, and occurs within a few days, like usually within four days of that second dose. Now the symptoms can include chest pain or trouble breathing, but the majority that were um, reported on recovered very um, nicely. They had mild uh, illness. You treat it actually with uh, NSAIDs, those something like Advil, you know, actually Advil works well to treat it. So right. they treated, uh, treated with medications and rest at home. So that's where we're at right now, but it's not clearly like caused by the vaccine. It's still being investigated. Mm -hmm. Now the CDC has another meeting on Friday. We'll get more information. Um, so in terms of, should you wait to get that second dose? Um, 
Well, it depends on where you're at, you know, and if you're in a place that has the Delta variant, uh, then getting that second dose may be really important uh, because um, that second dose does provide that better protection. Absolutely. Uh, and then um, the uh, s second part of this question, what are the risks and what should people look for or do afterwards? Um, like you mentioned, what is the treatment for myocarditis and are there actually any long-term implications of myocarditis? Okay, so um, the, the symptoms are trouble breathing, chest pain, palpitations, um, and so those are signs that you should actually go to your emergency department. It's actually, a, you can actually diagnose it with an electrocardiogram, with some um, uh, blood work, and also sometimes with uh, some other imaging. It is treatable. Um, and so, and so this is the part that we're still under investigation. Were all of the cases that might have been linked to the vaccine treatable? It seems right now, but that's the part that we still are waiting for some more information to provide that full picture. Right. And doctor, are there any long-term implications of myocarditis? Is it like if you get it once you're susceptible, it'll happen all the time? No, that's not necessarily the case. We know actually that myocarditis and pericarditis is more common in young people, actually. It is a heart condition that occurs in young uh, individuals, including young males. And the commonest cause for it can be things like viral infections. Um, and so, so that's usually, so we actually see it, like it's not like it's a rare thing. It does certainly occur and you diagnose it and usually caused by viral infections, including COVID. Like COVID can cause this as well too. So just because you got it once doesn't mean that you're gonna be at risk uh, in the future. Okay. Um, and then uh, does the Moderna virus carry the same risks of myocarditis? Have there been cases of that after taking Moderna and not just Pfizer? Yes, so that FDA data actually showed that um, after the second dose, there were definitely cases after Moderna, maybe even uh, the rate was uh, slightly higher as well, too. Now, it's hard to know if that's really because Moderna, you know, it occurs more often in Moderna. Again, that's why we need to actually wait for, for all of the data to come in to, to make that full assessment. But yes, it seems to be if, if it is a real um, situation related to the messenger RNA vaccines for now. Okay. Um and then uh, following up to that, is there anything that can be done before getting the second dose of Pfizer to reduce the risk of myocarditis, like boost the immunity or extra sleep, drink water, any, any of those things? Yeah, it's a really good question. Again, we're, we're tr still trying to figure it out. Like, is this caused by the vaccine? Or, or maybe it's that people had a viral infection and that's what's causing it. And because we're giving millions and millions of doses. So, um, you know, if it's caused by an infection, well, preventing that infection will certainly prevent the myocarditis. Right. Uh, but we don't quite have much more to say than that. Okay. And then um, this is the last part of the question. Uh, between T9 and CV, they had quite a few. Um, should, they, should people avoid physical activity after the vaccine? You know, is that a precaution or does that not matter? It's not, this is not caused by physical activity, no. But I think the important point is that if you have symptoms, uh, don't ignore them, like do seek mm -hmm. medical attention for that. Now, I think it's important to know that the number of cases that have been, um, that they're investigating is still small compared to the millions and millions of doses of these vaccines that have been given. And so I think that's important to put in context because it's also, that's the comparison to also the cases of COVID and the people that end up in hospital or ICU because of COVID. So that, that's why we still say the benefits of getting the vaccine outweigh the risks. Right. Okay. Um, let's go on to some live questions that we have coming in here. Um, Cher asks, have we gotten closer to knowing how often we need to get booster shots of the COVID-19 vaccines? No, I mean, there's no recommendation right now for a booster shot, except for that second dose, of course. That second dose is a booster shot. But beyond that, no, we don't have any line of sight for a third dose uh, recommendation right now. Okay. And the reason for that, uh, let me explain, though. The reason for that is because the two doses are giving us good protection, and the two doses are still covering us from variants, including new variants, like the Delta variant. The vaccines are still working against those variants. Right. Um, okay, uh, Denise asks, when will children under 12 be able to get vaccinated? Do we have a timeline on that? 
It all depends on when uh, a vaccine, vaccines are licensed in that younger age group. And uh, right now there's, you know, it may still take um, several weeks to months. Right, right. Um, but I, I think, actually, can I just add to that? Absolutely. Is that, you know, there was a study that was released uh, this week uh, from Israel that showed that actually in a house, if an adult is vaccinated, that actually protects the kids in the house. And so I think in the meanwhile, yeah. getting all adults in the home, uh, you know, anyone that has any contact with those younger children vaccinated, that's actually been shown to help the younger children. Absolutely. That's, that's actually really encouraging. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to some more live questions here. Uh, Rose asks, for those who took AstraZeneca for dose one, uh, if they have the choice for dose two, what would you recommend? Would you say stick to AstraZeneca if they can get it, or shall they move on to mRNA? I think, uh, you know, it's really a personal uh, decision. I think uh, there's a lot of good reasons to pick a messenger RNA vaccine. Like, I don't think you have to be worried about that at all. Uh, it, it, it's uh, going to be safe. Uh, it's going to give you good uh, immune protection. And it's also readily available yeah. to get a dose of that uh, Pfizer and Moderna. And you don't have to run the risk of that rare blo blood clotting uh, disorder. So for, for some of those reasons, that might be a, a good choice. Right. Uh, and then lots of live questions coming in. Okay, let's go to Wings. Um, what type of vaccine is the new Novavax vaccine? Uh, the Novavax is a protein subunit vaccine, as far as I understand, and that's actually very similar to the flu shot vaccine. So the way, so it actually has the spike protein um, in it, and then your body develops an immune response directly to that. That's the type of um, a vaccine it is. So is that what they call like a dead dead vaccine virus? Uh, sorry, dead virus vaccine? It, it's an inactivated virus. Yeah, exactly. It's but it's not the whole. No, it's not an inactivated virus. It's an inactivated sub. It's a subunit. So it's a piece of the virus. Like the coronavirus uh, has the spike proteins. It's just a piece that mm -hmm. spike protein, um, and that that's what the vaccine's made up of. Right. Right. As opposed to the mRNA vaccine, which instructs your body to create the spike protein and then antibodies are created. That's right. Yes, that's right. Um, okay. And then uh, let's move on here. Nala asks, I guess this is a federal question, but perhaps you have some insight, doctor. When will the three days quarantine be lifted for travelers? You mean the, the hotel quarantine? Yeah, yes. because right now it's actually 14 day quarantine yeah, for yeah, travelers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a federal question. So, I mean, we we certainly defer to the, the federal guidance for workers who are exempt for what all travelers have to do. And, um, I, you know, I can say to you, though, that as we have more and more people vaccinated, as our COVID cases down come down, I mean, we will be lifting public health restrictions, including uh, border restrictions, including travel restrictions as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay. I'm just going to read this out as it's coming in. Marlena asks, I read on the provincial site uh, that the new second dose appointments made from June 16th will be getting Moderna regardless of the first dose. If I keep my original um, second dose appointment, which is 16 weeks apart, uh, made when I first received my first shot, will I get Pfizer like I got my first dose? Is, that, is, uh, is there an option of not mixing? Okay, so it's a really good question. It's just that the vaccine supply comes in week by week. And yeah. you'll remember, like, just even back, we just actually don't even know what we're getting until we get it sometimes. And so right now, we got a big shipment, you know, two and a half million doses of Moderna in Ontario. Moderna is a, it, they're, they're twin sisters, they're twin brothers, they're very, very similar vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. That is the vaccine um, that will predominantly be available uh, in the next uh, week, maybe the next two weeks. Uh, it, there's no guarantee that just sticking with your appointment um, that you're going to be guaranteed Pfizer because if we don't have Pfizer, we can't give it to you. So um, it's, and it's not that we don't want to, you know, honor what you were booked for. It's just purely based on supply. Right. And so in that case, if a second appointment is available sooner, then they don't need to wait for that 16 weeks, just book it even if it's Moderna. 
Yeah, exactly. And I might recommend that actually, because, you know, if you're eligible for the second dose earlier, well, that probably means that you're in an area that might have the Delta variant. I mean, we've actually seen it all across the province, including in the far north, including in uh, big cities like where I live. And so, um, you know, and we know with that variant that the second dose really does give you that additional extra protection. And it's not just, you know, second dose of the same vaccine. It's a second dose giving you that booster response. Right, right. Um, and then let's go to another live question here. Uh, Vashti asks, is there any way to know what variant of COVID a person actually has? Uh, so if you actually got COVID, uh, yeah, I mean, it goes on to test for uh, whether it's the UK variant or it looks like it will be versus 50% of uh, all of the samples are being tested for that, the Delta variant. So if, if your, if your uh, test is gone on to be tested, that result will be available in your file. Um, but it can sometimes take uh, several weeks to get that result. And uh, so you could follow up with your doctor to see if there's anything available on, on the computer system on that. Right, okay. Uh, and then we'll go back to our submitted questions for now, but please keep submitting your live questions. We will take them if we have time. Um, so let's move on here to uh, Tina's question. Um, is it true that there is a concern about young males fertility being affected after the vaccine? No, that's not that's not true. Um, and I know that I've been asked that many times, and I have not been able to find any clinical studies, any scientific studies, to say that. So the fact that it's out there means that someone has made that claim without any scientific backing. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of very very good reasons to get vaccinated, um, and there's no evidence that vaccination will impact fertility. Um, okay, Mary asks, uh, up to date, there are no official uh, data published confirming the efficacy of mixing AZ and mRNA vaccines. Um, if I am at eight weeks of receiving my first uh, AstraZeneca shot, um, and I have both AstraZeneca or mRNA available, which one should I go for? And if I opted for the mRNA shot, uh, and a few <laughs> days or months later, there, there are, you know, there's data that says the clinical trials are not in favor of mixing what would be the impact at that time? Okay, uh, yeah, so this is why I say it really is a personal decision for what you want for that second dose. Uh, there is actually a, a lot of good data on the mixing schedules. Um, the, the, you know, you're right, it's not necessarily efficacy data to compare, well, if you had AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, or AstraZeneca and Moderna, or AstraZeneca and Pfizer, uh, you know, would you be less likely to get infected? But what we do have is good data on the immune response, the antibody response following vaccination. Right. And that uh, data shows that you actually get a stronger antibody response after the mixed schedule than you do with AZ, AZ. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then this is one we haven't had before. Sonia asks, my son is 13 years old and has the has vitiligo, the skin condition. Um, is it safe for him to take the Pfizer COVID vaccine? Yes. So having and that that skin condition is often an autoimmune condition, and uh, there have been many youth vaccinated with autoimmune conditions. Many adults also vaccinated with autoimmune conditions. Um, and right now, it, it's you know if you have that skin condition, you still want protection from COVID. Um, and so I would still recommend uh, the vaccine, yeah. Um, moving on, uh, Condor asks, why is it not more information being made public about any dangerous side effects of the vaccine? Are the dangers being hushed up um, and is the public being misled? I think we're being pretty transparent, actually. I think when we knew about that dangerous side effect of the severe blood clots related to AstraZeneca, once we found out about it, we were sharing that information. And I, I've just spoken to you about the myocarditis, pericarditis situation. That's certainly not as serious as the severe blood clots. It is, um, people are recovering. Um, it is a milder illness, but we're being transparent about it. I think also 
you should note that on the Public Health Ontario website and the Public Health Agency of Canada website, they report uh, the side effects uh, following vaccination. So um, there certainly is no uh, concerted effort to, to hide any of this information. And if anything, I think we're trying to give information even when there's no confirmed links, like the myocarditis, pericarditis situation. It's not a confirmed link, but I think we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Right, absolutely. And also, I think a lot of the times it's where to find that information. I know you've mentioned the federal government is also keeping track of um, side effect related injuries, that kind of thing. It's just a matter of where to find that information. And most often what we do is we look at the websites. That's the main, that's where everything is being published. We look at the Ontario website, we look at the Toronto website, and we look at the Canada website. And I think most of the um, information that is available from the government is all up there. That's right. That's right. If, it, if it's available, it's posted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. And then uh, Jasbir asks, um, can transplant patients get the vaccine for COVID-19 and will there be any serious side effects? Uh, he says he's been staying home for over, over a year now. So would it be better for him to just avoid the vaccine? Um, and are there any numbers to convince me to get my vaccine as a transplant patient? Yeah, well, I, I, what I would first say is talk to your transplant physician because transplant physicians are very clear that they want their transplant patients vaccinated because you're at such high risk because you're on these um, medications that weaken your immune system. In order to keep your transplant uh, you know, alive, you have to be on these very strong medications. And so you really, if you got COVID, it would be very, very serious. So whatever you can do to prevent COVID uh, would be really important. And so actually, if you're a transplant patient, you actually qualify for two doses of the vaccine in that shorter interval. Yes. Um, you know, a, about a month apart. And so, and that's because the first dose, you may not get the best protection because of uh, probably the medications that you're on. And so those two, that second dose is really important to boost you, but it is safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and another live question coming in from Rose again. Uh, will AstraZeneca offer a booster or will all the booster doses now be mRNA? And this is actually related to another question we had submitted over the past week is that when is AstraZeneca coming back? I want to stick with AstraZeneca. Okay. Um, so as far as I know, like we, don't, we don't have any plans for a third dose. And, um, you know, if we have a third dose, will it only be Pfizer or Moderna? What about AstraZeneca? I actually don't ha have the answers for that. It's a really good question. We, you know, uh, you see a lot of the decisions or the availability of vaccines has been on supply. We actually haven't had much AstraZeneca to be able to, to offer it uh, in a large amount. Um, and so I think that's an important point. Even the Janssen and Janssen, it's been approved, but we have not had a supply for that yet. So, um, so, you know, if you were, uh, you know, really wanted an AstraZeneca vaccine, well, that's a viral vector vaccine. Maybe in the future, we might have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That might be an option for you. Um, but uh, for now, um, if booster doses are required, I would imagine that most vaccine manufacturers will produce a booster dose, but I, I certainly can't, can't speak on their behalf. Right, absolutely. Uh, another live question coming in, Linda asks, uh, for the second dose of Moderna, will there be the same symptoms, or I, I assume she means side effects, as the first dose? Yes, so it's a, it's about the same. Yes, that headache, not feeling well, muscle aches. In Moderna, some people had uh, swollen glands, but we know that you can actually get that after Pfizer. Mm -hmm. With the Moderna vaccine, the one difference is um, about a week or so after the vaccine, you can get a very sore or heavy uh, swollen arm. Uh, but that, again, goes away. It's a small pe small number of people that get that. Um, and that is probably one of the few ones that is specific to Moderna. Okay. Okay. And then this is a good one. Um, this person is anonymous. They ask, I got my first dose of the vaccine in Canada. Can I get my second dose outside of Canada because I have to go to Europe? Yeah, you'll have to find out in the country where you go. I mean, I certainly can't guarantee or speak on behalf of the country. The one thing that I can say is that when you come back, I mean, even if it's been, say, eight months or nine months, you can get your second dose then. You wouldn't have to restart your series. Um, you know, as much as you can, of course, it's always good to, to, to travel with the two doses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Yeah, and actually uh, on that note, um, our reporter Faiza Amin actually did a story about this yesterday regarding Canadians abroad who feel like they are currently in limbo because if you're a foreigner in that country, for the most part, you're likely lower down on their priority list, especially if you're young and don't have any you know, pre-existing conditions, all of that kind of stuff. So really great story up on citynews.ca right now if you guys want to check it out. Um, so, you know, so, so, sort of a cautionary tale regarding travel to other countries because you don't know if they're going to give you your second dose or not. Um, yeah, so that's right. And, and here in Ontario, we have a very um, accepting policy like anyone, yeah. whether you have OHIP, you don't have OHIP, you're, you know, a, a visitor and you're, you're here because you, you can't go back home. Yes, you can still get vaccinated here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, another live question coming in here. Uh, Vito asks, uh, I got my Pfizer dose, uh, uh, first dose on May 23rd. When can I get my second shot? So currently we said it was May 9th was the date right now. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, again, when they open up spots, a lot of it is based on supply, right? And so uh, there's no point uh, getting you to book your second dose if you're going to be booking it out until September because we don't have supply to open up more clinics. So I think as supply, more supply comes in, they can uh, allow more people to book their second doses. Right. And again, uh, yesterday, I believe the uh, Health Canada said that we will have so many millions of doses coming in over the next few weeks that ideally everybody who wants to get a vaccine will get fully vaccinated by the end of September. So that's really encouraging in terms of timelines. Exactly, yes, very encouraging. Okay, well, well we have a few minutes, so I'm gonna go back to our submitted um, cache of questions here. Um, Judy and uh, Anonymous have a similar question. Um, if I have my second dose done and I'm fully vaccinated, is it still possible that I can um, have the virus myself and spread it to others? So does that mean that I'm protected, but other people around me are not protected? Okay, so if you're fully vaccinated, well, congratulations. If you are, uh, that's great. You're, you've dramatically reduced your risk of getting COVID. There is still a small chance that you could get COVID. And in that case, if you got COVID, like symptoms of COVID, then you could spread it in that case. Now, I think part of your question is, well, could you have COVID without even knowing it and spread it? And it looks like the vaccines prevent against that. So they prevent against that asymptomatic infection and and spreading the virus. I've heard people talk about shedding the virus. It, pre it prevents that. So mm -hmm. you're less likely to spread uh, the virus to, to others um, if you're vaccinated. So, so vaccinating will protect you and ideally protect others around you because you're not going to spread it. Exactly. And if we go back to that study that I talked about in, in a home, right? If an, if an adults are vaccinated and their children then become protected, that again speaks to that same concept, right? right? That they're not bringing COVID into the home, whether they have symptoms or not. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then here we go. Uh, Amy asks, I received my first AstraZeneca shot on April 23rd. I am 46. How soon can I physically receive my second shot of AstraZeneca? I want AstraZeneca uh, and shouldn't the province consider uh, perhaps allowing those who want it to get it at a shorter interval? Okay, so I think actually on the weekend, the policy changed, right? So um, now April 23rd, I mean, you're not quite at eight, eight weeks yet. So I would just book your appointment for the eight week, eight week point so that you could get, get, get it then, yeah. Right. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, nothing live yet, but let's go back to these submitted questions. Um, Karen asks, once you are uh, double dosed and two weeks out from there, what are you able to do then with family and friends indoors or outdoors? Okay, well, right now we don't have any recommendations for the individual. Like I know the CDC has them and says, well, if you're vaccinated, you can do X, Y, or Z. We don't quite have that. What we have in Ontario is the three-step framework and it talks about as a community, Mm -hmm. If we have this much vaccination rates, if our COVID rates are down, this many two doses, then we can move on to enjoy, you know, the parts of, of the steps. Mm -hmm. In step three, that's the step that I think a lot of people are waiting for. And that's when we need high vaccination first dose, higher second dose, low um, COVID rates. And then we can actually have some of those indoor gatherings, you know, some of those things that I think people are really looking forward to, but that's right now the approach that we're taking in Ontario. 
Right. It's more community based. So doctor, just hypothetically, if two people are fully vaccinated, um, what exactly are the risks, you know, fully vaccinated two weeks out from the second dose, what are the risks of them interacting sort of in close quarters without masks, you know, if they're hanging out and maybe they're driving somewhere together, um, are those risks substantially re reduced or are we still looking at, you know, staying six feet apart, doing all of the, all of the things that we have been doing? Okay, so I can say that the risks are lower than if you were not vaccinated, that's for sure. But again, while we still have COVID circulating in our community, the risks then become higher because of that. It's not because you're vaccinated. I mean, you're vaccinated, you're, you have very good protection, right? More than 90% protection. But there's still that 10% that, you know, one in 10 uh, not necessarily protected and so that so and so while COVID is still circulating that means out of 10 people vaccinated p perhaps one might uh, have symptoms or get right. COVID and so that that's why we are still recommending that you keep the distance wear the mask because our numbers still have to come down just just a bit more yes yes um okay and then just a, one more question here um, I am, Patty says, I am fully vaccinated in Florida. Can I come into Canada with a negative test result within 72 hours without quarantining? Uh, no, unless you are, you know, unless you meet the criteria for an exemption or you're, uh, you know, like an essential worker crossing the border. If you're just a visitor coming to visit, you still have to quarantine. Right, absolutely. And so uh, we're just coming up to one o'clock now. So we're going to wrap this up. Linda, I do see your live question. We're going to save that for next week. Uh, the doctor will be back with us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, doctor, for taking the time and having the patience to answer all of these questions. Thank you to everybody that submitted live. Uh, we will hold your questions from this week for next week uh, when we see the doctor again. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.